Operation Torch 8 to 16 November 1942, formerly Operation Gymnast, was an Anglo-American invasion of French North Africa during the North African campaign of the Second World War. Torch was the debut of the mass involvement of US troops in the European North African theater. The Soviet Union had long pressed the US and British to start operations in Europe and open a second front to reduce the pressure of German forces on the Red Army. While U.S. commanders favored Operation Sledgehammer, a landing in occupied Europe as soon as possible, British commanders believed that it was premature and likely to end in disaster and proposed landings in French North Africa. On 28 July, the Axis Africa Corps, under General Erwin Rommel, captured Mursa Matru, in Egypt, only 140 miles 230 kilometers from Alexandria. Landings in northwest Africa would reduce pressure on Allied forces in Egypt, secure Allied naval control of the southwest Mediterranean and enable an invasion of southern Europe in 1943. The U.S. President, Roosevelt, suspected that such landings would rule out an invasion of western Europe in 1943 but agreed to support the British Prime Minister Winston Churchill. Senior U.S. commanders remained strongly opposed to the landings and after the Western Allied Combined Chiefs of Staff CCS met in Washington on 30 July, General George Marshall and Admiral Ernest King declined to approve the plan. Roosevelt gave a direct order that Torch was to have precedence over other operations and was to take place at the earliest possible date, one of only two direct orders he gave to military commanders during the war. Background The Allies planned an Anglo-American invasion of northwestern Africa, Maghreb, Morocco, Algeria and Tunisia, territory nominally in the hands of the Vichy French government. With British forces advancing from Egypt, this would eventually allow the Allies to carry out a pincer operation against Axis forces in North Africa. The Vichy French had around 125,000 soldiers in the territories as well as coastal artillery, 210 operational but out-of-date tanks and about 500 aircraft, half of which were Duotine D.520 fighters—equal to many British and U.S. fighters. These forces included 60,000 troops in Morocco, 15,000 in Tunisia, and 50,000 in Algeria, with coastal artillery, and a small number of tanks and aircraft. In addition, there were 10 or so warships and 11 submarines at Casablanca. The Allies believed that the Vichy French forces would not fight, partly because of information supplied by American Consul Robert Daniel Murphy in Algiers. The French were former allies of the U.S. and the American troops were instructed not to fire unless they were fired upon. However, they harbored suspicions that the Vichy French Navy would bear a grudge over the British attack on Mers el Kebir in 1940. An assessment of the sympathies of the French forces in North Africa was essential, and plans were made to secure their cooperation, rather than resistance. German support for the Vichy French came in the shape of air support. Several Luftwaffe bomber wings undertook anti-shipping strikes against Allied ports in Algiers and along the North African coast. General Dwight D. Eisenhower was given command of the operation, and he set up his headquarters in Gibraltar. The Allied naval commander of the expeditionary force would be Admiral Sir Andrew Cunningham, his deputy was Vice Admiral Sir Bertram Ramsey, who would plan the amphibious landings. <laughs> <laughs> Allied plans Planners identified Oran and also Algiers and Casablanca as key targets. Ideally there would also be a landing at Tunis to secure Tunisia and facilitate the rapid interdiction of supplies travelling via Tripoli to Rommel's forces in Libya. However, Tunis was much too close to the Axis airfields in Sicily and Sardinia for any hope of success. A compromise would be to land at Bone in eastern Algeria, some 300 miles 480 km closer to Tunis than Algiers. Limited resources dictated that the Allies could only make three landings and Eisenhower, who believed that any plan must include landings at Oran and Algiers, had two main options, either the western option, to land at Casablanca, Oran and Algiers and then make as rapid a move as possible to Tunis some 500 miles 800 km east of Algiers once the Vichy opposition was suppressed, or the eastern option, to land at Oran, Algiers and Bone and then advance overland to Casablanca some 500 miles 800 km west of Oran. 
He favored the eastern option because of the advantages it gave to an early capture of Tunis and also because the Atlantic swells off Casablanca presented considerably greater risks to an amphibious landing there than would be encountered in the Mediterranean. The combined chiefs of staff, however, were concerned that should Operation Torch precipitate Spain to abandon neutrality and join the Axis, the Straits of Gibraltar could be closed cutting the entire Allied forces lines of communication. They therefore chose the Casablanca option as the less risky since the forces in Algeria and Tunisia could be supplied overland from Casablanca albeit with considerable difficulty in the event of closure of the straits. Marshall's opposition to Torch delayed the landings by almost a month, and his opposition to landings in Algeria led British military leaders to question his strategic ability. The Royal Navy controlled the Strait of Gibraltar, and Spain was unlikely to intervene as Franco was hedging his bets. The Morocco landings ruled out the early occupation of Tunisia. Eisenhower told Patton that the past six weeks were the most trying of his life. In Eisenhower's acceptance of landings in Algeria and Morocco, he pointed out that the decision removed the early capture of Tunis from the probable to only the remotely possible because of the extra time it would afford the Axis to move forces into Tunisia. Topic. Intelligence gathering In July 1941, Mieczysław Slawikowski, using the codename Riger, Polish for Rigor, set up Agency Africa, one of the Second World War's most successful intelligence organizations. His Polish allies in these endeavors included Lieutenant Col. G. Widow Langer and Major Maximilian Czeski. The information gathered by the agency was used by the Americans and British in planning the amphibious November 1942 Operation Torch landings in North Africa. Topic. Preliminary contact with Vichy French To gauge the feeling of the Vichy French forces, Murphy was appointed to the American consulate in Algeria. His covert mission was to determine the mood of the French forces and to make contact with elements that might support an Allied invasion. He succeeded in contacting several French officers, including General Charles Mast, the French commander-in-chief in Algiers. These officers were willing to support the Allies but asked for a clandestine conference with a senior Allied general in Algeria. Major General Mark W. Clark, one of Eisenhower's senior commanders, was dispatched to Cherchel in Algeria aboard the British submarine HMS Seraph and met with these Vichy French officers on 21 October 1942. With help from the resistance, the Allies also succeeded in slipping French General Henri Giraud out of Vichy France on HMS Seraph, passing itself off as an American submarine, intending to offer him the post of Commander-in-Chief of French forces in North Africa after the invasion. However, Giraud would take no position lower than commander-in-chief of all the invading forces, a job already given to Eisenhower. When he was refused, he decided to remain a spectator in this affair. <laughs> <laughs> Battle The Allies organized three amphibious task forces to simultaneously seize the key ports and airports in Morocco and Algeria, targeting Casablanca, Oran and Algiers. Successful completion of these operations was to be followed by an eastwards advance into Tunisia. A Western task force aimed at Casablanca was composed of American units, with Major General George S. Patton in command and Rear Admiral Henry Kent Hewitt heading the naval operations. This Western Task Force consisted of the U.S. 2nd Armored Division and the U.S. 3rd and 9th Infantry Divisions—35,000 troops in a convoy of over 100 ships. They were transported directly from the United States in the first of a new series of UG convoys providing logistic support for the North African campaign. The Center Task Force, aimed at Oran, included the U.S. 2nd Battalion, 509th Parachute Infantry Regiment, the U.S. 1st Infantry Division, and the U.S. 1st Armored Division—a total of 18,500 troops. They sailed from the United Kingdom and were commanded by Major General Lloyd Fredendall, the naval forces being commanded by Commodore Thomas Trowbridge. Torch was, for propaganda purposes, a landing by U.S. forces, supported by British warships and aircraft, under the belief that this would be more palatable to French public opinion, than an Anglo-American invasion. 
For the same reason, Churchill suggested that British soldiers might wear U.S. Army uniforms, although there is no evidence that this tactic was implemented. Fleet Air Arm aircraft did carry U.S. Star roundels during the operation, and two British destroyers flew the Stars and Stripes. In reality, the Eastern Task Force aimed at Algiers was commanded by Lieutenant General Kenneth Anderson and consisted of a brigade from the British 78th and the US 34th Infantry Divisions, along with two British commando units No. 1 and No. 6 commandos, totaling 20,000 troops. During the landing phase, ground forces were to be commanded by U.S. Major General Charles W. Ryder, Commanding General CG of the 34th Division and naval forces were commanded by Vice Admiral Sir Harold Burrow. U-boats, operating in the eastern Atlantic area crossed by the invasion convoys, had been drawn away to attack trade convoy SL-125. Aerial operations were split into two, east of Cape Tenez in Algeria, with British aircraft under Air Marshal Sir William Welsh and west of Cape Tenez, all American aircraft under Major General Jimmy Doolittle, under the direct command of Major General Patton. P-40s of the 33rd Fighter Group were launched from U.S. Navy escort carriers and landed at Port Laiuti on November 10. Additional air support was provided by the carrier USS Ranger, whose squadrons intercepted Vichy aircraft and bombed hostile ships. Casablanca <laughs> <laughs> The Western Task Force landed before daybreak on 8 November 1942, at three points in Morocco, Safi Operation Blackstone, Fedala Operation Brushwood, the largest landing with 19,000 men, and Media Port Laiuti Operation Goalpost. Because it was hoped that the French would not resist, there were no preliminary bombardments. This proved to be a costly error as French defences took a toll of American landing forces. On the night of 7 November, pro-Allied General Antoine Bethuard attempted a coup d'état against the French command in Morocco, so that he could surrender to the Allies the next day. His forces surrounded the villa of General Charles Nogues, the Vichy Loyal High Commissioner. However, Nogues telephoned Loyal Forces, who stopped the coup. In addition, the coup attempt alerted Nogues to the impending Allied invasion, and he immediately bolstered French coastal defences. At Safi, the objective being capturing the port facilities to land the Western Task Force's medium tanks, the landings were mostly successful. The landings were begun without covering fire, in the hope that the French would not resist at all. However, once French coastal batteries opened fire, Allied warships returned fire. By the time General Ernest Harmon's 2nd Armored Division arrived, French snipers had pinned the assault troops most of whom were in combat for the first time on Safi's beaches. Most of the landings occurred behind schedule. Carrier aircraft destroyed a French truck convoy bringing reinforcements to the beach defences. Safi surrendered on the afternoon of 8 November. By 10 November, the remaining defenders were pinned down, and the bulk of Harman's forces raced to join the siege of Casablanca. At Port Laiuti, the landing troops were uncertain of their position, and the second wave was delayed. This gave the French defenders time to organize resistance, and the remaining landings were conducted under artillery bombardment. With the assistance of air support from the carriers, the troops pushed ahead, and the objectives were captured. At Fedala, weather disrupted the landings. The landing beaches again came under French fire after daybreak. Patton landed at 8 o'clock, and the beachheads were secured later in the day. The Americans surrounded the port of Casablanca by 10 November, and the city surrendered an hour before the final assault was due to take place. Casablanca was the principal French Atlantic naval base after German occupation of the European coast. The naval battle of Casablanca resulted from a sortie of French cruisers, destroyers, and submarines opposing the landings. A cruiser, six destroyers, and six submarines were destroyed by American gunfire and aircraft. The incomplete French battleship Jean Bart, which was docked and immobile, fired on the landing force with her one working gun turret until disabled by the 16-inch caliber American naval gunfire of the USS Massachusetts, the first such heavy caliber shells fired by the U.S. Navy anywhere in World War II. Two U.S. destroyers were damaged. Topic: <laughs> Oran. The center task force was split between three beaches, two west of Oran and one east. Landings at the westernmost beach were delayed because of a French convoy which appeared while the minesweepers were clearing a path. 
some delay and confusion, and damage to landing ships, was caused by the unexpected shallowness of water and sandbars. Although periscope observations had been carried out, no reconnaissance parties had landed on the beaches to determine the local maritime conditions. This was in contrast to later amphibious assaults such as Operation Overlord in which considerable weight was given to pre invasion reconnaissance. The U.S. 1st Ranger Battalion landed east of Oran and quickly captured the shore battery at Arzu. An attempt was made to land U.S. infantry at the harbor directly, in order to quickly prevent destruction of the port facilities and scuttling of ships. The operation—code named Operation Reservist—failed, as the two Banff-class sloops were destroyed by crossfire from the French vessels there. The Vichy French naval fleet broke from the harbor and attacked the Allied invasion fleet, but its ships were all sunk or driven ashore. French batteries and the invasion fleet exchanged fire throughout 8 to 9 November, with French troops defending Oran and the surrounding area stubbornly. Heavy fire from the British battleships brought about Oran's surrender on the 9th of November. Topic: <inaudible> <inaudible> Airborne landings. Torch was the first major airborne assault carried out by the United States. The 2nd Battalion, 509th Parachute Infantry Regiment flew all the way from Britain, over Spain, intending to drop near Oran and capture airfields at Tafraoui and La Sanilla, respectively 15 miles 24 km and 5 miles 8 km south of Oran. The operation was marked by weather, navigational and communication problems. Poor weather over Spain and the extreme range caused the formation to scatter and forced 30 of the 37 aircraft to land in the dry salt lake to the west of the objective. Nevertheless, both airports were captured. <inaudible> <inaudible> Algiers <inaudible> <inaudible> Resistance and coup as agreed at Cherchel, in the early hours of 8 November 400 mainly Jewish French resistance fighters staged a coup in the city of Algiers. Starting at midnight, the force under the command of Henri Diastier de la Vigerie and José Aboulker seized key targets, including the telephone exchange, radio station, governor's house and the headquarters of 19th Corps. Robert Murphy took some men and then drove to the residence of General Alphonse Juin, the senior French army officer in North Africa. While they surrounded his house making Juin effectively a prisoner, Murphy attempted to persuade him to side with the Allies. However, he was treated to a surprise. Admiral François Darlin, the commander of all French forces, was also in Algiers on a private visit. Juin insisted on contacting Darlin, and Murphy was unable to persuade either to side with the Allies. In the early morning, the local gendarmerie arrived and released both Juin and Darlin. Topic. Invasion On 8 November 1942, the invasion commenced with landings split between three beaches—two west of Algiers and one east. Under overall command of Major General Charles W. Ryder, commanding general of the U.S. 34th Infantry Division, British 11th Brigade Group from the British 78th Infantry Division, landed on the right-hand beach, U.S. 168th Regimental Combat Team, from the 34th Infantry Division, supported by 6th Commando and most of 1st Commando on the middle beach while the U.S. 39th Regimental Combat Team, also from the U.S. 34th Division, supported by the remaining five troops from 1st Commando landed on the the left-hand beach. The British 36th Brigade Group from the British 78th Division stood by in floating reserve. Though some landings went to the wrong beaches, this was immaterial because of the extremely low level of French opposition. All the coastal batteries had been neutralized by French resistance, and one French commander openly welcomed the landing allies. The only fighting took place in the port of Algiers, where in Operation Terminal, two British destroyers attempted to land a party of U.S. Army Rangers directly onto the dock, in order to prevent the French destroying the port facilities and scuttling their ships. Heavy artillery fire prevented one destroyer from landing, but the other was able to disembark 250 Rangers before it too was driven back to sea. The landed troops pushed quickly inland and General Juin surrendered the city to the Allies at 1800. Topic. Aftermath Topic. Political results It quickly became clear that Giraud lacked the authority to take command of the French forces. 
He preferred to wait in Gibraltar for the results of the landing. However, Darlin in Algiers had such authority. Eisenhower, with the support of Roosevelt and Churchill, made an agreement with Darlin, recognizing him as French High Commissioner in North Africa. In return, Darlin ordered all French forces in North Africa to cease resistance to the Allies and to cooperate instead. The deal was made on 10 November, and French resistance ceased almost at once. The French troops in North Africa who were not already captured submitted to and eventually joined the Allied forces. Men from French North Africa would see much combat under the Allied banner as part of the French Expeditionary Corps consisting of 112,000 troops in April 1944 in the Italian campaign, where Maghrebis mostly Moroccans made up over 60% of the unit soldiers. When Adolf Hitler learned of Darlin's deal with the Allies, he immediately ordered the occupation of Vichy France and sent troops to Tunisia. The eisenhower darlin agreement meant that the officials appointed by the Vichy regime would remain in power in North Africa. No role was provided for Free France, which was supposed to be France's government in exile, and which had taken charge in other French colonies. This deeply offended Charles de Gaulle as head of Free France. It also offended much of the British and American public, who regarded all Vichy French as Nazi collaborators, and Darlin as one of the worst. Eisenhower insisted however that he had no real choice if his forces were to move on against the Axis in Tunisia, rather than fight the French in Algeria and Morocco. Though de Gaulle had no official power in North Africa, much of the population now publicly declared free French allegiance, putting pressure on Darlin. Then, on 24 December, Fernand Bonnier de la Chapelle, a French resistance fighter and anti fascist monarchist, assassinated Darlin. Bonnier de la Chapelle was arrested on the spot and executed two days later. Giraud succeeded Darlin but, like him, replaced few of the Vichy officials. He even ordered the arrest of the leaders of the Algiers coup of 8 November, with no opposition from Murphy. The French North African government gradually became active in the Allied war effort. The weak French troops in Tunisia did not resist German troops arriving by air. Admiral Esteva, the commander there, obeyed orders to that effect from Vichy. The Germans took the airfields there and brought in more troops. The French troops withdrew to the west, and within a few days began to skirmish against the Germans, encouraged by small American and British detachments who had reached the area. While this was of minimal military effect, it committed the French to the Allied side. Later all French forces were withdrawn from action to be properly re-equipped by the Allies. Giraud supported this but also preferred to maintain the old Vichy administration in North Africa. Under pressure from the Allies and from de Gaulle's supporters, the French regime shifted, with Vichy officials gradually replaced, and its more offensive decrees rescinded. In June 1943, Giraud and de Gaulle agreed to form the Comité Français de Libération Nationale. CFLN, with members from both the North African government and from de Gaulle's French National Committee. In November 1943, de Gaulle became head of the CFLN, and de jure head of government of France, recognized by the US and Britain. In another political outcome of Torch and at Darlin's orders, the previously Vichyite government of French West Africa joined the Allies. Topic. Military consequences. Topic. Toulon One of the terms of the second armistice at Compiègne agreed to by the Germans was that southern France would remain free of German occupation and self-governed from Vichy. The lack of determined resistance by the Vichy French to the Allied invasions of North Africa and the new de Gaulle policies in North Africa convinced the Germans that France could not be trusted. Moreover, the Anglo-American presence in French North Africa invalidated the only real rationale for not occupying the whole of metropolitan France. It was the only practical means to deny the Allies' use of the French colonies. The Germans immediately occupied southern France and German troops moved to seize the French fleet in the port of Toulon, beginning on 10 November. The naval strength of the Axis in the Mediterranean would have been greatly increased if the Germans had succeeded in seizing the French ships, but every important ship was scuttled at dock by the French Navy before the Germans could take them. Tunisia After the German and Italian occupation of Vichy France and their unsuccessful attempt to capture the interned French fleet at Toulon Operation Lila, the French Armée de Frique sided with the Allies, providing a 3rd Corps, Corps for Anderson. 
Elsewhere, French warships such as the battleship Richelieu rejoined the Allies. On 9 November, Axis forces started to build up in Tunisia unopposed by the local French forces under General Barre. Racked with indecision, Barre moved his troops into the hills and formed a defensive line from Taborsouk through Medjez el Bab and ordered that anyone trying to pass through the line would be shot. On 19 November, the German commander Walter Nering demanded passage for his troops across the bridge at Medjez and was refused. The Germans attacked the poorly equipped French units twice and were driven back. However, the French had taken heavy casualties and, lacking artillery and armor, Barre was forced to withdraw. After consolidating in Algeria, the Allies struck into Tunisia. Elements of the British First Army under Lieutenant General Kenneth Anderson came to within 40 miles 64 kilometers of Tunis before a counterattack at Jidida thrust them back. In January 1943, German and Italian troops under General Feldmarschall Erwin Rommel retreating westward from Libya reached Tunisia. The British Eighth Army in the east commanded by Lieutenant General Bernard Montgomery stopped around Tripoli to allow reinforcements to arrive and build up the Allied advantage and to repair the port there. In the west, the forces of the First Army came under attack at the end of January, being forced back from the Fade Pass and then suffering a reversal at Sidi Bo Zid on 14-15 February. Axis forces pushed on to Sabaitla and then to the Kasserine Pass on 19 February, where the U.S. Second Corps retreated in disarray until heavy Allied reinforcements halted the Axis advance on of February. Fredendal was replaced by George Patton. General Sir Harold Alexander arrived in Tunisia in late February to take charge of the new 18th Army Group headquarters, which had been created to take overall control of both the 8th Army and the Allied forces already fighting in Tunisia. The Axis forces again attacked eastward at Medanine on 6 March but were easily repulsed by the 8th Army. Rommel counseled Hitler to allow a full retreat to a defensible line but was denied, and, on 9 March, Rommel left Tunisia to be replaced by Jürgen von Arnhem, who had to spread his forces over 100 miles 160 kilometers of northern Tunisia. The setbacks at Kasserine forced the Allies to consolidate their forces and develop their lines of communication and administration so that they could support a major attack. The 1st and 8th Armies then attacked the Axis in April. Hard fighting followed, but the Allies cut off the Germans and Italians from support by naval and air forces between Tunisia and Sicily. On 6 May, as the culmination of Operation Vulcan, the British took Tunis, and American forces reached Bizerte. By 13 May, the Axis forces in Tunisia had surrendered. This opened the way for the Allied invasion of Sicily in July. <laughs> Later influence. Despite Operation Torch's role in the war and logistical success, it has been largely overlooked in many popular histories of the war and in general cultural influence. The Economist speculated that this is because French forces were the initial enemies of the landing, making for a difficult fit into the war's overall narrative in general histories. The operation was America's first armed deployment in the Arab world since the Barbary Wars and, according to The Economist, laid the foundations for America's post war Middle East policy. Topic. Orders of battle Topic. Western Task Force, Morocco Vice Admiral H. Kent Hewitt, USN Major General George S. Patton, USA Northern Attack Group Mahedia. Brig. General Lucian K. Truscott 9,099 officers and enlisted 60th Infantry Regiment reinforced of 9th Infantry Division 1st Battalion of 66th Armored Regiment of 2nd Armored Division 1st Battalion of 540th Engineers Center Attack Group Fedhala. Maj. Gen. J. W. Anderson 18,783 officers and enlisted 3rd Infantry Division 7th Infantry Regiment reinforced 15th Infantry Regiment reinforced 30th Infantry Regiment reinforced Southern Attack Group Safi Maj Gen Ernest N Harmon 6423 officers and enlisted 47th Regimental Combat Team of 9th Infantry Division 3rd and elements of 2nd Battalion of 67th Armored Regiment of 2nd Armored Division 
Topic: Central Task Force, Oran. Commodore Thomas Hope Trowbridge, RN. Major General Lloyd R. Fredendahl, USA. Approximately 39,000 officers and enlisted. First Ranger Battalion. First Armored Division, Maj. Gen. Orlando Ward. Combat Command B. Sixth Armored Infantry Regiment. First Infantry Division, Maj. Gen. Terry Allen. Sixteenth Infantry Regiment. 18th Infantry Regiment 26th Infantry Regiment Topic. Eastern Task Force, Algiers Rear Admiral Sir Harold M. Burrow, RN Major General Charles W. Ryder, USA Approximately, 33,000 officers and enlisted British, approximately, 23,000 Number 1 Commando No. 6 Commando 78th Infantry Division, Maj. Gen. Vivian Eveleg 11th Infantry Brigade 36th Infantry Brigade United States, approximately, 10,000 9th Infantry Division, Maj. Gen. Manton S. Eddy 39th Infantry Regiment 34th Infantry Division, Maj. General Charles W. Ryder 135th Infantry Regiment 168th Infantry Regiment Topic. French Army, Morocco Fez Division Maj. Gen. Maurice Marie Salbert 4th Moroccan Rifle Regiment 5th Moroccan Rifle Regiment 11th Algerian Rifle Regiment 1st Foreign Cavalry Regiment Meknes Division Maj. Gen. André-Marie François Dodi 7th Moroccan Rifle Regiment 8th Moroccan Rifle Regiment 3rd Moroccan Spahis Regiment Casablanca Division Brig. Gen. Antoine Bethuart 1st Moroccan Rifle Regiment 6th Moroccan Rifle Regiment Colonial Moroccan Infantry Regiment 1st Hunters of Africa Regiment Marrakesh Division Brig. Gen. Henry Jules Jean Maurice Martin 2nd Moroccan Rifle Regiment 2nd Foreign Infantry Regiment 4th Moroccan Spahis Regiment Topic. French Army, Algeria Algiers Division Maj. Gen. Charles Mast 1st Algerian Rifle Regiment 9th Algerian Rifle Regiment 3rd Zouaves Regiment 2nd Hunters of Africa Regiment 1st Algerian Spahis Regiment Oran Division Gen. Robert Boisau 2nd Algerian Rifle Regiment 6th Algerian Rifle Regiment 15th Senegalese Rifle Regiment 1st Foreign Regiment Moroccan Division 7th Moroccan Rifle Regiment 3rd Algerian Rifle Regiment 4th Tunisian Rifle Regiment 3rd Foreign Rifle Regiment Topic. See also List of World War II battles Mieczysław Zygfried Slawikowski RMS Multan Troopship North African Campaign Timeline Operation Flagpole World War II. Operation Husky Operation Kingpin World War II. 17th Armored Engineer Battalion Marching Regiment of the Foreign Legion Topic. References Notes Topic. Bibliography 
War official reports Les Cahiers Francais, la part de la résistance française dans les événements de Frique du Nord official reports of French resistance group leaders who seized Algiers on 8 November 1942, to allow Allied landing, commissariat à l'information of Free French Comité National, London, August 1943, war correspondent report Melvin K. Whiteleather, Main Street's New Neighbours, J.B. Lippincott Co., Philadelphia, 1945, Academic Work Sabelker, Professor Jose, Lavis Tuze, Christine. 2002. 8 November 1942, Les Armées Américaines et Anglaises prennent Alger en cans hers. Espoir in French. Paris, N. Degree 133. Allen, Bruce. 2007. 1999. Exit Rommel, The Tunisian Campaign, 1942-43. Stackpole Military History Series. Mechanicsburg, PA, Stackpole Books. ISBN 978-0-8117-3381-6. Anderson, Charles R. Algeria-French-Morocco 8 November 1942 – of November 1942. World War II Campaigns. Washington, United States Army Center of Military History. ISBN 0 16 038105 3. CMH Pub 72 11. Brewer, William B. Operation Torch The Allied Gamble to Invade North Africa. New York, Street Martins Press. Brown, J. D. Carrier Operations in World War II, The Royal Navy. London, Ian Allen. Dannon, Professor Eve Maxime. La vie politique à Alger de 1940 à 1944 in French, Paris, LGDJ. Eisenhower, Dwight D. Crusade in Europe. London, William Heinemann. OCLC 559866864. Edwards, Bernard Donitz and the Wolf Packs. Brockhampton Press. ISBN 1-86019-927-5. Funk, Arthur L. The Politics of Torch. University Press of Kansas. Haig, Arnold The Allied Convoy System 1939-1945. Naval Institute Press. ISBN 1-55750-019-3. Howe, George F. North West Africa, Seizing the Initiative in the West. The United States Army in World War II, Washington, D.C., United States Army Center of Military History. LCCN 57060021. CMH Pub 6-1. Lavis Tuze, Christine L'Afrique du Nord dans la guerre, 1939-1945 in French. Paris, Albin Michel. Lewis, Adrian S. 2001. Omaha Beach, A Flawed Victory. Chapel Hill, University of North Carolina Press. ISBN 0-8078-2609-X. Meyer, Leo J. 2000 Chapter 7, The Decision to Invade North Africa Torch. In Kent Roberts Greenfield. Command Decisions. United States Army Center of Military History. CMH Pub 70-7. Michel, Henri Darlin. Paris, Hachette. Morrison, Samuel Elliott Operations in North African Waters, Vol. 2 of History of United States Naval Operations in World War II. Boston, Little, Brown & Co. ISBN 0-7858-1303-9. Moses, Sam November 2006. At All Costs, How a Crippled Ship and Two American Merchant Mariners Turned the Tide of World War II. Random House. O'Hara, Vincent P. 2015, Torch, North African and the Allied Path to Victory Annapolis, Naval Institute, 2015, x. 371 pp. Playfair, Major General ISO, Milani, Brigadier CJC, Flynn RN, Captain FC and Gleave, Group Captain TP 2004, First HMSO 1966. Butler, J.R.M., ed. The Mediterranean and Middle East, The Destruction of the Axis Forces in Africa. History of the Second World War United Kingdom Military Series. I.V. Uckfield, UK, Naval and Military Press.
ISBN 1-84574-068-8. Rower, J. and Hummelchen, G. Chronology of the War at Sea 1939–1945. Naval Institute Press. ISBN 1-55750-105-X. Salinas, Alfred Les Américains and Algérie 1942–1945 in French, Larmaton, Paris Watson, Bruce Allen 2007 Exit Rommel, The Tunisian Campaign, 1942–43. Stackpole Military History Series. Mechanicsburg, PA, Stackpole Books. ISBN 978-0-8117-3381-6. OCLC 40,595,324, General Atkinson, Rick 2002. An Army at Dawn. Henry Holt. ISBN 0-8050-6288-2, further reading the decision to invade North Africa Torch Part of Command Decisions a publication of the United States Army Center of Military History Algeria French Morocco a book in the U.S. Army Campaigns of World War II Series of the United States Army Center of Military History Topic. External links A detailed history of 8 November 1942 Combined Ops History and photos of the operations of the USS Ranger and its air group during Operation Torch North African Jewish resistance to Nazis and the Holocaust The Accord Franco-American of Messelmoon in French Royal Engineers Museum Royal Engineers and Second World War Operation Torch Report of the Commander in Chief Allied Forces to the Combined Chief of Staff on Operations in North Africa Operation Torch Allied Invasion of North Africa article by Williamson Murray Eisenhower's report on Operation Torch Operation Torch Motion Pictures from the National Archives Operation Torch Operation Torch World War II